Hey everyone, this amazing ESO Network show is brought to you by our fine sponsor, Amazon.com. Please remember to shop Amazon for all your geeky needs, no matter what time of the year it is. All you need to do is go to ESOPodcast.com slash ESO Amazon, or click on the Amazon banner on the ESO Network webpage to go to our e-store. It's the best way to shop and the best way to support this program, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. Okay, that's enough of me babbling for now. Now on with your regular scheduled show. Hello, Marvel Universe! The Earth Station MCU podcast is your home for all things related to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Join our debrief as we discuss Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Agent Carter, upcoming and past favorite Marvel movies, cosplay, comics history, toys, games, interviews, and all things MCU. Whether you're a hero or a villain, a new viewer, or have been reading comics since you were a kid, there's something for you on Earth Station MCU. Welcome again to the Monster Sci-Fi Show Podcast. I am your host, The Monster, and welcome to my rewatch series. The idea about the rewatch series podcast is to look back at a movie, especially one that I hated at the first viewing. The goal is to do some research about the production and get the behind-the-scenes information about the movie and then rewatch it with fresh new eyes. So with my analysis of my brilliant and superior mind, I will answer this simple question. Can you rewatch this movie again? So at the end of this podcast, I will give one of two audio clips in which it will be a yay or nay. But before we do that, please remember everyone has a right to like what they like. This is just my opinion. The third victim, I mean the third movie chosen for this series, is Ang Lee's 2003 Hulk. Before I get started, I'm going to be playing an Ang Lee interview with Charlie Rose. Did you see Charlie Rose last night? Little SNL reference there. In which he's talking about why he wanted to do this movie. When I come back, I'll start talking about the background information of all the players and give you more information. Uh, I was allowed to do a big movie that's personal. And yeah, this a big movie that's personal. We know what's big about it, which was the budget and the oh, character yeah, and, and the huge summer, comic the and all, commerce, summer release everything. and all that. What's personal about it? Well, he's the alter ego. He's the s- subconsciousness, so to speak. Um, it's something very hard to do in a big movie. And I've sort of... Ho- Forced me to hulk out. To hulk out. To hulk out. <laughs> as a cinema person, as a as a human being, because uh, there's probably not such a thing. It's very unsettling. It's enigmatic, and of course, it's big and green. And how do you stress the audience belief so they also can invest the real emotion, which I usually do. That, mm. that's, that's what I do. How how can I stretch that range as a filmmaker? So how that, does, that, that yeah. that's that's yeah. personal and yeah. subconsciousness and doesn't have a logic and I have to allow that to happen. On the same time, I, I, I'm a big boy now. I have to deliver a summer movie. <laughs> it has to play a certain <laughs> it pattern. It was time for Ang Lee to make a summer uh, movie. Uh, yeah, but in my kind of way. So there you have it. He basically wanted to make a summer movie, and Hulk seemed to be the big project that he wanted to do. So, if you know Ang Lee's work, prior to Hulk, he did Crouching Tigers, Hidden Dragon, and then 2003, he did The Hulk, and then 2005, he directed Brokeback Mountain, which he got an Oscar for Best Director, and 2012, Life of Pi, Oscar for Best Director. A phenomenal director, but why did I hate this movie? We'll talk about that in a moment. But 
let's start off with the cast and kind of work that way first. So we have Eric Bono, who is Bruce Banner. He was in 2001 Black Hawk Down. Again, 2003, he was playing in Hulk. 2005, he was in Munich. And 2009, he is in Star Trek The Reboot with J.J. Abrams and plays the character Neo, who, at first glance, I really didn't care for, but I grew to like Neo a lot more down the road. We also have Jennifer Connelly, who is someone I've been watching since the 80s, practically. I, I knew her from Labyrinth from 1986, The Rocketeer in 1991. She also did Dark City, one of my wife's favorite movies, in 1998. And then, of course, she did The Hulk in 2003. A new project, and this one has been in the works for some time with James Cameron producing. It's called Alita, Battle Angel, and I believe this is an anime that she is now going to be part of that. So, again, 2018 looks like it's going to be a really good year for a lot of recurring movies or new movies that are based on comic book properties or mangas. We also get Sam Elliott, who I, I knew of him back in 1985 when he did the movie Mask. Another one, 1987, Fatal Beauty, what he played with uh, Whoopi Goldberg. Rush, 1991, one of my favorite movies back then. And of course, Hulk in 2003. And 2007, Ghost Rider with Nicolas Cage, playing The Caretaker. Again, one of my wife's favorite movies. But actually, I've grown to like that movie as well. But the one scene is when Ghost Rider and The Caretaker are riding off into the, des- the distance. And the caretaker, you find out, is a former ghostwriter. Very cool, indeed. Lastly, we have Nick Nolte. And I knew of Nick Nolte since 1977, that year that Star Wars came out. We had a movie called The Deep, which I saw earlier this year, thanks to Hoopla. And it's a fantastic movie. He also went to do 1979, North Dallas 40. 1982, he did 48 Hours with... Eddie Murphy, which is his first movie. Extreme Prejudice, 1986, Walter Hill, another fantastic movie that I highly recommend. If you have not seen it, I recommend that to be part of your list. So when we look at the cast, we have, of course, Eric Bana playing Dr. Banner. And for the most part, when I looked at what was going on with the casting... We had, at one point, Steve Buscemi being actually being considered for this role. And when I think about the comic book character of Dr. Bruce Banner, there's lots of incarnations of that character, both in comics and TV, and of course in the movies. But the one thing that comes out with Steve Buscemi is that if you're looking at a very weak and meek uh, doctor... That is probably maybe one of the better versions that you could think of. But him turning into a Hulk, and if he's supposed to kind of look Hulkish with his Steve Buscemi face, I don't think that would have worked as much as I love him as a character actor. I think he's fantastic. The other note is that Edward Norton also was considered for this role, but he didn't like the script. So he did not do it but came back to do The Incredible Hulk. So that's a kind of a weird turn of events. But Ang Lee liked him a lot and cast him upon a movie called Chopper, which I don't know too much about. In this case, we have Eric Bana, who is now the the lead in this role. We have Jennifer Connelly, who is playing the role of Betty Ross. Now, for the most part, Betty Ross, like in the comics, was... Not necessarily a damsel in distress, but she was a girlfriend of Banner. But in the movie, they kind of had a separation or they're no longer together. But there is still um, a sense of connection between these two characters. So, for the most part, it was... In the very beginning, I kind of understood the establishing of their relationship. And I actually felt the chemistry work a little bit more this time around, rather than the initial... uh, viewing but i thought not bad but again she became later on somewhere in the middle of the movie a damsel in distress but 
as the climax came to be, sort of, she helped uh, Dr. Banner regain back his humanity by allowing him to revert back to his human self after the Hulk is on a rampage. And then we have, of course, Sam Elliott, who is the General Thunderbolt Ross, who, with his mustache, was almost on par with the character that I had in mind from the comics. It looks very much like that. He was a very hot-headed character that was in the comics, though in here, it was a little bit more justified about his actions for national security, but... I thought the casting of Sam Elliott, who doesn't seem to freaking age, was f- fantastic and spot on. And then Nick Nolte um, is a character that he played uh, David, Dave Banner. So it was interesting to see that they brought a father figure to have against Banner. And the story had it so that it was interesting to see the genetic experiments that he did on himself was going to be passed on to his unknowing son. So that later on came to be between the father and son struggle. So when I look at everyone's reasoning to be in this Hulk movie, now granted, this is, again, 2002, 2003. Marvel really hasn't had their stuff together. I'm not going to curse you. But... Disney was not in the picture. Marvel was really funding their own projects with cooperation with whoever owned the rights. Everyone was interested in not doing a a kitty summer junkie superhero movie. Everyone wanted to work with Ang Lee because of what he brought or what he can bring, a more of a psychological effort to explain the hidden side of a person's psyche. So, with that sense, you know, there are a lot of elements of Frankenstein and heck, uh, Heckle and Jekyll. <laughs> a lot of elements of Jekyll and Hyde. Oh, Jesus, Dr. Jekyll and Hyde. Why am I going Heckle and Jekyll? So, when I looked at everyone's history uh, uh, and their little notes about why they wanted to do this picture, it's only because of Ang Lee. They, everyone wanted to work with Ang Lee in whatever way. It wasn't as if, you know, they were getting thrown tons of money. No, they saw that what Ang Lee has done in past movies and what he is capable of doing, everyone wanted to work with him. This was not going to be the stereotypical kiddie superhero movie, so that's the reason why everyone was on board, and you got this cast of talented actors there. So, moving on from the cast and the director... The other thing is that, of course, we have the music. Now, if you hear the score at the very beginning, that's the score by Danny Elfman, who, if you know, he has done previous superhero movies. He's done for The Flash. He's done for Batman. That's not an issue here. Actually, the beginning themes, I've actually kind of liked that theme. However, he was brought in to replace... Uh, another composer, and I believe it's it was Michael Dana, who was the original composer, but the studio executives didn't like the non-traditional approach that he had using the Japanese psycho drums, African drums, and Arabic singing. So, out of respect, Ang Lee had asked for Danny Elfman's help, and he was able to do it. Now, he did keep some of Michael Dana's music cues and really when we hear the arabic kind of singing it's really more when the there's a desert scene and especially associated with hulk but you do get a sense of what danny was working with with limited time and it's not too bad when i think about listening to danny elfman's score in comparison to other marvel movies I think his is pretty high on the list, considering one of the things, aside from the villain aspects that Marvel has, is going to be more of themes. What music is going to be associated with this hero? 
And for the most part, the music that we hear later on in other Marvel movies, they're okay. But honestly, it's not strong. It's not memorable. At least here, you do get a theme that is played out throughout the movie, and it's consistent. Whereas you start off strong in, let's say, Captain America in the very beginning, but then somewhere in the middle it gets lost, and then... You don't really remember it. At least to me, Danny Elfman, I remember that score. More so than, again, any other Marvel movie. So, as I mentioned before, we did get other Hulk movies. We get Ed Norton playing the Incredible Hulk. And then we get, after that, Mark Ruffalo playing in The Avengers. That version of Dr. Banner and Slash Hulk as well as Avengers Age of Ultron. And of course, upcoming, we're getting Thor Ragnarok, in which Hulk is going to be part of that cast, and finally talking. So we'll see how that all plays out. So with the competition, when this movie came out, again, 2003, the week before, June 13th, what was out? Well, you had Dumb and Dumberer, and then Rugrats go wild. So it's not as if it's uh, any movie that would carry over to the second week that would be number one. So Hulk really had a good shot of becoming a really big blockbuster on June 20th. But on the, the week after, June 27th, we have the sequel to Charlie's Angels, uh, Charlie's Angels Full Throttle, and 28 Days Later, which is Danny Boyle horror movie. So, considering that's going to be a problem to kind of keep up, it did show up in the box office. June 20th, that weekend, it pulled in $62.1 million, which is fantastic. That's a great situation to be in. However, however, when we look at the second week and we see the drop-off, the rule of thumb is that you're going to lose about 50% of your business. So if you remember Batman versus Superman from first week to the second week, lost a significant amount of money because, again, it was more than 50% that they lost. Even Spider-Man Homecoming, as I talked about before, first week to second week, more than 50%. So, people were complaining that this movie was horrendous, but it made its money in the long term. So, when I look to the Hulk, not 50% that it lost, not even 60%, 70% it lost from first week to second week. So, imagine the outcry if that Hulk movie came out today. So, people were complaining about and losing their minds about Batman vs. Superman. This movie did horrendous in the box office. With a budget of about $137 million, it was able to gross $132 million domestically, and then globally it came out to $245 million and change. Not exactly gangbusters. So, considering that they still made another movie down the road about five years later is surprising but again things change down the road because even though marvel was still trying to recoup money and made iron man and then the did the hulk right after that that's when disney bought marvel out and got the rights to those characters so but again marvel was trying to do self-financing of all these films there's no way they could have ever done this by themselves with the type of scale that we know as the MCU right now. When I look at the behind the scenes, there was definitely a lot more intensity from what I'm gathering about the way Ang Lee shot the movie. About, if you see how stylized it looks, there's lots of little inserts, lots of pictures within pictures and so there's a lot of work that's going in and there are a lot of takes that you're trying to do an art film or trying to do a stylized 
superhero movie that hasn't really done be done before. So I can really see a lot more work going through to be put in. Now, the other thing, too, we have to realize, when this came out in 2003, the work that went in to create the CGI Hulk, because this is all going to be about a bigger-than-life character, we really didn't have a whole lot of CGI work to the point where it was photorealistic. Later on, we do get the Transformers movie, which was able to accomplish a lot better with robots interacting with physical objects or physical world. This movie was really kind of the the genesis of what we will later see with CGI. So, aside from that, I tried to find anything about the screenplay, which I could not find. So I did find some information about early drafts in which one point one draft was going to have characters like the leader and Zax as well as the absorbing man. What for some reason it didn't dawn on me until I read this information that in the final product is that David's father did have some characteristics of Zax as well as the absorbing man. I didn't, for some reason, I did not make the connection that he was an absorbing man, even though he, his, like, initial scene when he, um, got a full blaster of radiation, his hand became, let's say, part metal or whatever thing that he touched, he was able to become that thing. So in my head, the Absorbing Man is not the exact same version that I had in my head from the comics or even from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in Season 2 in which they brought in an Absorbing Man uh, character, which I thought, that's perfect, that's spot on. And even got the, the, the Wrecking Ball with the chain on it, which that's his signature thing. Here, it was just, oh, so he can do this thing, but I didn't realize... That's who you're trying to do, is make that character into the Absorbing Man. So, it was okay. It was fine. Um, I just thought that, again, this is one of the first forays from Marvel, and they were trying to do something different that has not been done before. And you have to at least give them some credit for trying to do something different with a, a very highly regarded director. You have, at that time, state-of-the-art CGI work. Let's go move on to what the critics say. So Rotten Tomatoes, the critics loved it, apparently. They gave it a 61%, whereas audiences gave it a 29% rating. A couple of quick quotes. One wrote, an interesting effort to give one of the staples of mass entertainment something extra in the way of insight and feeling. And this is one that's going to be negative. That's from the audience. Ang Lee tried too hard to make this look like a comic book with a scene within a scene style sequence which was starting to get in the way of the storytelling. It was starting to aggravate and annoy me because I would rather have gone back to normal. So I definitely agree with that. Uh, it did was interesting in the very beginning, but after a while I'm like, enough, start, stop doing what you're doing. <laughs> but there are certain shots in which when Banner was starting to turn, I think for the second time when he was being interrogated at his house, there was a shot of his head close up, and as the, the camera um, is focused on his face, it's moving with his motion of his head as he's transforming or going through this transformation. And that was, I thought it was a very cool shot. Kind of like if you had... A GoPro stuck to your face, or like you have the headgear with the GoPro in front of you, and if you move your head, the camera will go with the movement of your face. So I thought that was kind of a, a cool shot to see. So for the most part, I thought it was okay from that sense of what they were trying to do, but yeah, it was overly stylized to the point that it was very distracting. So what I'm gonna do. I'm going to play the trailer to Hulk. 
Look at you. Off to college to be a great scientist. Like your father. There's something inside you so special. Someday you're going to share it with the whole world. Let's see if you get more radiation. Countdown started. Final match released. Stronger. You know I never hurt you. When you're left with no choice, I'm sending her a surprise visit from some friends of mine. When you're pushed too far, you're a pathetic freak. Don't just get even. You're making me angry. Get mad. I don't think you're gonna like me when I'm angry. Yeah. And unleash the hero within. So let's do a recap before I give my final decision. So when it came to casting problems, none. Everyone gave good performances. I, I again I mentioned I enjoyed the the nuance um, acting that Jennifer Connelly and Eric Bana had between the two. I love Sam Elliott. Everyone was good. I thought Nick Nolte was a little over the top at times, but that's Nick Nolte, so let's leave it at that. Uh, as far as the script, again, I couldn't find much in the way of the screenplay, but I could see what they were trying to do with certain characters uh, to be part of the storyline. Didn't necessarily all come together smoothly, but again, Marvel was trying to get its foot out there before Disney was able to back them up and give them the money that they needed. So what was good about it, as I mentioned before, the CGI for Hulk, not bad. Again, 2003 is really quite primitive by our standards, what we have right now. We take that for granted. So when I look at Hulk fighting against certain helicopters in the desert, I was actually quite impressed by how well it looked, or him fighting the tanks and pulling them apart or throwing them away. or So... You know, I've been itching for another Hulk movie, so this kind of helped fill a need to kind of tide me over until we get Thor Ragnarok. So, again, I was okay with it. Now, my bad points, and I talked about this already, it's over-stylized. That whole, I think the first half hour is just non-stop of him doing all these different (sighs) insert shots or Shots blending into another to go into another scene. I know you're trying to do a, a, a shorter origin story, but it seemed very convoluted. And it just, it took a while for certain things to get done. And I think once Banner did get the the initial uh, dose of gamma radiation, that's when the story started to pick up a little bit more and of course, I was happy to see uh, the cameo of Stan Lee and Lou Ferrigno. But uh, the other point that I'm going to have to bring up is the fact is that Eric Bonnet, for as well as I like him, 
I think this banner didn't do anything for me. At one point, he said that he even started to like having this feeling, which to me is out of character right off the bat because that's something that he would never do. He would never want that to be unleashed. So, and it wasn't as if he's like a bully who now has superpowers and he's willing to get back at them. So, that was the one thing that really kind of was a little bit off-putting because, again, Banner would never do that. Bill Bixby, I think, to me, will be the ultimate Banner character because of the fact that he has this terrible secret and he has to keep this hidden. But there are situations in which he encounters in which he has to, unfortunately fight tooth and nail to keep from this creature from uh, getting out of him and he's he turns into the Hulk and then it all starts all over again he can't have a normal relationship with people he is he's willing to help out and, and start his life over again but every time like every episode he starts walking that last shot and you hear the piano music playing in the background it's so heartbreaking but that's what you want to have something be relatable to us as an audience. Is that you have sympathy or empathy for a character like what Banner is going through. But this version of Banner, of Banner with Banner, <laughs> there's none. And that's I think that's what's lacking. So as much as I really like the Hulk, there's just that other component of Banner that's just missing. What is my verdict? It does get a pass. Believe it or not, it does get a pass. It is not the best comic book movie superhero to date. But again, I give Marvel credit for at least trying to do something different. An approach that's unusual by going with a non-traditional action director or superhero director. So he tried to give all his best uh, to this movie. And actually, the experience that he had to work with CGI benefit him down the road making Life of Pi. So it's not as if Ang Lee is a terrible director. This is a movie that didn't come together for a lot of reasons. But now that I've discussed everything that I've learned along the way and rewatched the movie, it's okay. It is not as terrible as I think it is. So it is. Finally, we do have a rewatchable movie. So Hulk is no longer on the list of movies that I hate. So on that note, I ask all of you, if you love my show, please fill out my survey. Email me. Let me know what you think about Hulk. Follow me in the various social networks. So again, thank you for listening to me and to the Monster Sci-Fi Show podcast. Sci-Fi, from a certain point of view. Good night. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network, your station for all things geek, classic, current, and beyond. Be part of the crew at esonetwork.com.